start video. So, hello, hello yeah. everybody. Hi, hey, welcome to the to the East Coast. I know you're on the West Coast. So yes, thank um, you. Yeah, it's great to see you. And um, I'm going to ask you to share your screen, and then Dr. Freeman and I are going to disappear. All right. Uh, well, thank a... you for having me, and I'm uh, so excited to talk about my my favorite topic here. Let's see, if we can get the. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Is that just... looking good? That looks fantastic. Thank you, and we'll see you uh, on the other side. All right. Well, I'm delighted to to talk to you a little bit about how my favorite topic, positive psychology, interlinks with lifestyle medicine. Uh, it's all about being healthy and happy. And, uh, and that's the basis of this book, Strengths in the Mirror, uh, which uh, I came up with this uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I think we all experienced small and large traumas at the beginning of the pandemic. I remember quite well uh, March 13th of 2020, uh, when I was just having a, a lovely leisurely uh, lunch. I was lucky to have one with a, a friend and uh, got a phone call from my daughter's school that the school was indefinitely closing. And it, it put me into this kind of unimaginable abyss uh, because I'd never imagined a school in essence permanently closing. And then that many other uh, mini traumas, if you will, uh, emerged uh, uh, that we've collectively experienced in one way or another. And I was thinking a lot about, well, how, how do we become strong during uh, traumatic times? Uh, what are the strengths that we can find within ourselves uh, to get through difficult times? And actually uh, now more than ever, even as we're coming out of the pandemic, there are, there's so much uh, geopolitical unrest, uh, et cetera, that's happening around the world, uh, news about climate change problems. Uh, it's, uh, these, are, these are difficult times. And uh, so how do we stay strong, and healthy and happy? And uh, that's how the Strengths in the Mirror book originated about thriving now and tomorrow. And it really boils down to, I'll tell you right off the bat what the punchline is. <laughs> so you don't have to wait till the end. How do we thrive? We thrive by looking at two buckets. One bucket, which is around things we do every day to take care of ourselves. And the other bucket are things that we naturally carry within ourselves, our natural strengths uh, that can help us really uh, engage in those uh, self-care habits and beyond and help us uh, be, be happy and healthy. First though, we start where we are. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure all of us uh, could use um, improvement in our habits and even acknowledging what our strengths are. Sometimes we struggle, we're just down with our lives, with ourselves, stressed. Start where, start where you are. Uh, that self-compassion is an important positive psychology uh, tool and uh, we, we need to take it easy on ourselves and be kind to ourselves as we would uh, any close friend who's struggling. And uh, I have um, a list of questions here and I'm happy to share all these slides. I have quite a few slides where I'm asking you questions so you can uh, think about them and guide you to come up with uh, your own answers about how you can become healthy and happy. And again, first we start with where we are. So what are the challenges you're facing now? What are some challenges you've faced in the past? How have you handled them? Uh, what things worked, what things didn't work? Uh, just sort of getting a lay of the land is a good place to start. And then you move on to part of that lay of the land is do you have a thriving toolkit yourself? Uh, maybe you haven't used that terminology, but what do you turn to uh, during difficult times? And, and, uh, but a, a thriving toolkit is a nice image to have uh, as to what you rummage around in and pull out uh, during certain times. Uh, and maybe it's different tools at different times. 
And uh, as I said in the beginning, the first big bucket of those in that tool set is around strengths that we create through our daily actions. And uh, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine promotes six pillars of a healthy lifestyle. And these are daily actions that we can take both for our physical health, our emotional health, mental health, uh, which is physical activity, a whole food plant-based uh, eating pattern, getting adequate high quality sleep, avoiding risky substances, managing our stress. And the college has the sixth pillar as social connection, but I always expand it to include positive psychology more broadly and social connection is a part of that. But there are these other uh, elements of positive psychology that Martin Seligman, who's the, considered the founder and father of positive psychology, uh, he uh, made up this uh, framework or this acronym of PERMA, positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning, and achievement. And we'll, we'll look at those in, in a little more closely in a, in a few slides here. But this gives you sort of the, the overview of what's a comprehensive healthy lifestyle look like. And then you can see here through this next slide why I'm so passionate about the positive psychology component, because not only, as I just said, uh, positive psychology is an important pillar, one of these six pillars of a healthy lifestyle, but it is also foundational to all the other pillars because it's through positive emotions and positive activities that build positive emotions that we connect to those self-care habits that we are more likely to do them. And the more we do them, the happier and healthier we are. Um, and we'll take a look at a little graphic in a minute about that. Uh, and it is really about linking our self care habits to things that make us feel good in such a way that we don't have to force ourselves. We don't have to will ourselves like, you know, yeah, I've got a exercise, I've got to get my sleep. Uh, we are wired in such a way that once we start that upward spiral of positivity and positive emotions associated with these wonderful self-care habits, we naturally are inclined to do them again and again. And it's called a non-conscious motivation uh, rather than an outer should or you know, a, a sort of like I should, I must. Um, and this uh, upward spiral theory was uh, developed by Barbara Fredrickson who, and, and other colleagues, uh, leading positive psychology researchers that uh, says that not only is there a reciprocal reinforcing link between healthy lifestyles and positive emotions, but, but it's an upward out, outward spiral, as you can see, because it also builds additional resources to help reinforce those help, healthy and happy habits. Uh, an example of that is that when you're happier, you tend to have more friends, more social connection, because people like to be around you. And the more social connections you have, the more you can stay accountable. People can help you and be a support for you uh, to and maintain these habits. And uh, the next few slides are more details that I often share with health professionals and physicians about this reciprocal reinforcing link between the major healthy lifestyles and positive emotions. One that most people have known about is physical activity. There's a lot of literature and science that shows that physical activity boosts mood. It's a treatment for depression. In fact, it's, it's, it's uh, more effective for depression than standard medications for depression. And not only that, but people who uh, tend to have more happiness, more psychological well-being are more likely to exercise. And we've seen that through, I, I mentioned this prospective study, this long-term study that can tease that out. And the same is true for a whole food plant-based eating pattern. Um, it's a treatment for depression, but also uh, on top of that, it is a mood booster in general for all of us. And it, it can lead to greater happiness. And interestingly enough, again, that reciprocal reinforcing link uh, that happier people are just more likely to reach for those fruits and veggies and have uh, report a greater consumption of fruits and vegetables. 
We've all experienced this reciprocal reinforcing link with sleep and mood. If you're upset, anxious, you're not going to get a good night's sleep. When you don't get a good night's sleep, you wake up even more upset and anxious and, and cranky. And so if we can cut that cycle and get a good night's sleep, we wake up refreshed in a better mood, et cetera. And of course, there are also the physical health benefits of adequate, high quality sleep. So, so self-care habits, what are yours? What are you doing now? Um, and what can you add to your armamentarium to take care of yourself? And on my slides, I have in the parentheses, uh, I, the titles of these elements that we track in an app that I developed a few years ago. It's actually a website called the My Happy Avatar app, and we can talk more about that. And I'm also happy to come back and talk more about that. I don't sell it. It's available for free. That helps you track all of these important buckets uh, of well-being and strengths. And I think of the app as something that you can reach for, especially during difficult times. So here again, we, we're looking at daily action. What are those self-care habits that you have? And then what are the positive activities and activities that boost your positive emotions that now I've made the case are so important and intricately linked with self-care habits. Uh, so that's the second strength. The first strength is physical self-care habits. The second strength is positive activities. And then the third strength is I pulled it out is relationships because relationships is so important. And uh, there are a number of wonderful, the most robust studies uh, on earth uh, are these long-term cohort studies that show this. And uh, one of these is the adult development study at Harvard uh, where they followed these boys from uh, inner city Boston and compared them with uh, Harvard College boys uh, over many decades, they're still tracking them or their, their kids or grandkids. And so they have all this data to show that really they're able to tease out through the analysis that the single most important factor for health, happiness, and longevity is relationships. So that's an important uh, tool in our toolkit and an important strength that we uh, can build through our daily actions and building our relationships. Uh, but not only that, but we can have that benefit by interacting with strangers in an authentic hello, maybe the grocery store checker, for example, it gives us those same, some of those similar uh, physiologic benefits. So happier people tend to do healthier behaviors. They tend to exercise more, not smoke, use the seat belts, have that healthy, nutritious uh, eating pattern and avoid risky alcohol use. And happier people live longer. And we have lots of data about the mechanisms. We still need to tease out all those mechanisms, but uh, clearly uh, at the top of those mechanisms is a cardiovascular health. Uh, and that stems from a boost in the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system, which is our flight or fight uh, uh, response, right? So when we're stressed, uh, it, we're in the fight or flight response, but the opposite is this parasympathetic response, which is called the tendon befriend response. That's so good for our heart and our overall health. So happier people uh, benefit from cardiovascular health, happier people benefit from lower inflammation, from immune system strength, from longer telomeres, which help with our longevity uh, and uh, better endocrine regulation, hormone regulation, and as I made the case, healthier behaviors, which reinforce this entire cycle. So then I think I've made the case that we wanna be happier, we want positive emotions. How do we do it? There are lots of ways to do it. I've introduced this, this framework by Dr. Seligman of PERMA for positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning, and achievement. So let's take a quick look at each of these. So positive emotions can be boosted by gratitude practice, acts of kindness. It can be little things that we do on a daily basis. And these positive emotions improve our vagal tone, increase our heart rate variability. All that is tied to that parasympathetic nervous system and is oh so good for us. 
And, uh, and then the E, so that's P in PERMA, positive emotions, the E in PERMA is for engagement. So any activity that puts us in that feeling of flow where we're one with that activity, we lose track of space and time because we're concentrating on it, not so much that we wanna give up, but not so little that we're bored. It's just that sweet spot of good stress or you stress that fully engages us. And there are then wonderful releases of, of positive neurotransmitters and positive hormones that are good for our health during those moments. It's a kind of a meditative state. And here's a nice graphic that shows that flow channel, that sweet spot between anxiety and boredom. And so any activities, gardening, uh, running, uh, playing a musical instrument, making art uh, puts us in that flow or can put us in that flow state. So that's uh, for E for engagement. R for relationships, as I made the case, is uh, the single most important factor in our happiness, physical health and longevity through, and, and there've been other uh, long studies in, in addition to the Harvard Adult Development Study. And, uh, and really it all comes down to that parasympathetic nervous system. So that's R for relationships. Uh, the M is for meaning and uh, relationships is probably the most robust from a science perspective. M is probably the second, the meaning is the second most robust from a scientific perspective. There's lots of science that shows that if we can find a life purpose, uh, have a life meaning, at least find something meaningful today in, uh, to find in each day, something whether it's at work or outside of work, that we're going to derive all kinds of benefits. Uh, there's just a, a lower cognitive decline, particularly for older people. Uh, there's better cardiovascular health. There's a greater longevity. And then the A in PERMA is for accomplishment. We're as human beings wired to want to strive for things and to feel good about accomplishing our goals. So setting those goals and, and step-by-step step, making progress, seeing our progress, celebrating even partial successes uh, can make a, a huge difference in boosting our positive emotions and is good for us. And as you can see, all of these components of PERMA can be interlinked and also linked with a healthy lifestyle. Um, now, I wanna throw in one caveat is that uh, we need a lot more research on which kinds of positive activities work with which kinds of cultural groups. There's some early data that really is interesting that says that uh, different uh, cultures may respond uh, to what we would um, uh, consider standard positive psychology interventions. And why is that? Well, we need to tease that out. It may be uh, that uh, there are certain cultures that are more individualistic, for example, and other cultures are more collectivist. And I, I show here a, a study where they did a rotating intervention of what they took a group of South Korean participants and US participants, and they randomized to either do an act of kindness first, followed by a gratitude letter or the other way around. And the South Korean participants did better, reported feeling better after doing the act of kindness first and then the gratitude letter. And it was the reverse for the US participants. And uh, so the authors and other authors have, have speculated, again, we need more research, that uh, these uh, Asian cultures are more collectivist. And if they're writing a gratitude letter, they're also possibly uh, negating the positive emotions by having some negative emotions of indebtedness. And in their culture, you don't wanna be indebted to others. You want to be kind to others. You, you, so acts of kindness uh, are more accepted in that culture. Again, that's just one theory, but an example where we do need to be careful when we talk about positive psychology, certainly as health professionals, when uh, we want to recommend this uh, is to keep culture in mind and help people figure out for themselves what works best best for them until we have more research. And there is now some new exciting research that's ongoing and hopefully we'll, we'll have some more answers in the future. 
Uh, and so I often uh, encourage health professionals to write positive psychology prescriptions because uh, I've been making the case that it's so integral to healthy lifestyles. We often uh, think about, oh yeah, we got to help our patients with their exercise and their diet, but we really also need to help our patients with activities that will boost their positive emotions. And so uh, I made the case for meaning as being an important example of a positive psychology intervention. And so he Here's an example of a prescription that a health professional could make to a patient, uh, just like a medication prescription where we say what we talk about it, figure out what those meaning activities or purpose activities would be, how often the dose might be unlimited, uh, refills unlimited. Um, and uh, of course, it gives you examples. There might be spiritual activities, volunteer activities, work, uh, social activities that can be meaningful and also important to a comprehensive of healthy lifestyle. So we're back to what are our strengths? Strengths in the mirror. The strengths in the mirror are what we can develop to, to foster our well being through daily action, through our physical self care, through our positive psychology based activities, and through our relationships, our social resources. And uh, so we made the case for the self-care activities. This is a slide that's asking you to think about, okay, what are some of the positive activities that you're already doing? I'm sure this is not new to many of you and you're probably already doing things, but perhaps you might wanna uh, think about ways of enhancing or adding to your routine positive activities. And then I, again, I made the, the uh, strong case for social support and relationships. So how are you building your relationships with family and friends? How are you taking advantage of social connection? Um, what's your social network like? And you might even analyze your network based on your needs and who's in your life and are there any gaps in your life? Uh, and how can you fill those gaps? And uh, there, are there new people you can meet through classes and through other en engaging activities? as well as to always remember that we can benefit physiologically uh, and, and even in terms of our happiness by having authentic, simple, uh, but authentic uh, connections and hellos with anyone we meet throughout the day. And studies are pretty clear that if you have hundreds of those kind of micro moments of connectivity throughout the day, you can really benefit. So think about what are your action-based strengths. And notice I have the chain there because all of these are interlinked and they reinforce each other. Um, then how do we make, uh, make this stick? Uh, just ask yourself, uh, you know, what, what would work there for yourself? And we wanna go with the easy things first because that will stick. Uh, so that's obvious, but it's, it's good to reinforce. And uh, we've been talking about daily action. Now I'm going to shift and talk a little bit about what you naturally carry with you. Uh, what are your strengths? You may have thought about this. You may have been asked by family, friends, maybe on a job interview, what are your strengths? What do you bring to the table? Um, and, and you may know this by compliments you've had from coworkers, from family, friends, things that you know you're already naturally good at. Uh, in positive psychology, though, we have uh, taken it a step further, and uh, there's been some terrific research, and one of the leading researchers besides Martin Seligman, uh, whom I've mentioned, is Chris Peterson, that did uh, some significant uh, research around what's called character strengths. And now, uh, if you're not aware of it, you can go on uh, the University of Pennsylvania's website via character.org and take a um, questionnaire at no charge to identify your top strengths. Now, we all have these strengths, but some uh, we're even better at than others. And what the well-being research is showing is that the more we use our character strengths, the better our well-being. And we can use our character strengths to support our health habits, our happiness habits. Uh, and uh, it might be, for example, uh, that you, here's a list, you might have uh, creativity as a strength and might come up with some creative ways to do physical exercise or creative ways to create new healthy recipes. Or you might uh, have uh, a, um, 
a, a more hopeful view of the world and uh, and you're wanting to show that to the world uh, especially during these difficult times and use that strength to help others be hopeful uh, about th themselves and about the future so then it adds meaning to your life and adds meaning to their lives you're connecting with them so there's some examples of how we can use our character strengths to boost uh, not only our health habits but our relationships and um, add and meaning to our lives now the so that's the fourth strength in uh, strengths in the mirror and then the the fifth strength tool is brain strengths uh, which i don't have time this evening to go into in much detail this deserves a whole nother workshop and happy to give one at, at, at some point it is based on carl jung the psychiatrist carl jung's uh, construct of uh, cognitive functions was his terminology. I call them brain strengths. You can, uh, many of you are probably aware of the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator. That's one place to start. You can take that questionnaire and based on that four letter uh, result, uh, you can then figure out, well, what are the brain strengths most likely associated with that uh, personality type. And it's not really about identifying personality types, it's really about getting at uh, these cognitive functions. Um, now, you don't even have to take that questionnaire and you can start paying attention and see what comes to you naturally. Um, and there are eight of them, four are around information gathering and four of them are around decision making. And we each have uh, a better capacity or a comfort zone with one information gathering type of brain function and one decision making brain function. Uh, and I've spent probably close to three decades studying this. I'm working on a couple of books that are related to this because I also think using brain strengths to not only boost our health, our physical health and our happiness, uh, but also using our, our brain strengths just to support um, our uh, ourselves and our society in general um, doesn't get enough attention. Um, and uh, of course, there are psychologists that say this is controversial. Uh, I threw this in the book because it's just adding something more for you to think about when you sit back and look at that toolbox of, well, what, what do I have that I can build or what do I have that I bring to the table? And for some of you, this may not be so meaningful and you don't have to use it as a tool set. Um, but uh, if, uh, if I'm allowed to uh, give another talk some other time, I'm happy to, to share more details and convince you about how exciting this brain strength area is. Um, and uh, and uh, in the book, I do have an abbreviated version of uh, a brain strength questionnaire that sort of gets you in the, in the range of at least thinking about, oh, does that sound like me? Oh, let me now test that out. Let me experiment. And, and uh, it might be, for example, that uh, you um, tend to be more extroverted than introverted. Uh, so extroverted people might need more social support to build their happiness and to support their healthy behaviors. You might tend to more be more introverted and uh, your sweet spot for relationships and social support, you need less of those connections than ones uh, than people who are extroverted. And there are many other ways that we can apply and learn from our brain strengths. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's, I, I jumped ahead on the slide there. So that's the extroversion, introversion. Then the other interesting thing uh, is that planning, right? We want to build healthy behaviors. And, and for some of us, uh, we tend to do better with a plan, a very specific action plan. I'm going to, you know, go to the gym every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon type of thing. Uh, others, uh, you tell them that they're like, there's just no way that's just that's just never going to happen. I can't make that kind of commitment. I've got to be more spontaneous. And we can work with that. But acknowledging that there are differences in, in our approach um, and uh, using those strengths. So we have a strength of spontaneity. How do we then build in a spontaneous healthy lifestyle, for example? 
And that's, that's what this slide is. It's called perceiving versus judging. Perceiving is being more open-ended. Judging means uh, wanting things more planned. It's not the, the terminology that we're normally used to, but that's the terminology developed by Carl Jung and uh, Elizabeth Myers and, and uh, Isabella Briggs who developed this, these constructs. So back to where I started, uh, I thought, decided to write this book when we're in the midst of all of us collectively experiencing uh, either mini traumas or major traumas through the pandemic. Now we're collective experiencing additional traumas, even as we're coming out of the pandemic. What can we do for ourselves to be resilient, to be healthy, happy, resilient, and resilience means usually bouncing back. I'm talking about even what can we do to be anti-fragile? What can we do so that even if we're facing challenges, uh, we don't bend so much. Uh, we, we're an even keel because we have this, these tool sets to turn to on a regular basis. And in using these tools, when we do face trauma, we may actually grow. And there's a, a whole body of literature on post-traumatic growth. And post-traumatic growth, uh, the way that happens is we do have to look towards our strengths and our, again, our daily actions who we are, what we bring to the table uh, that pulls all of that together, again, to lead to happiness, physical health, longevity, uh, and, and more. So bottom line is, uh, what are your physical self-care habits? What are your positive psychology habits, your positive activities, your social habits? What are your character strengths? What are your brain strengths? Put those in the toolkit use them on a regular basis so that you're buffed up and you become anti-fragile during difficult times uh, and also ready to grow from those difficult times. And uh, I, I hope you have some, some good takeaways from this. I encourage you, again, I put these questions in here in my slides to, uh, that I can share so that you can sit down and take time to reflect and see what your answers are to some of these questions about what are your strengths, well, how are you, are you gonna use them? What kind of action steps are you gonna to take to build those strengths? Or if you're more of a perceiver like I am and you don't want an action plan, that's okay too. But at least you've started to light up some excitement about what you can do differently in your life and look out for new opportunities and be spontaneous in taking advantage of those health and happiness opportunities. Ultimately, it all boils down to our strength is who we are, what we bring to the table, what matters most to us. And that's actually the key question that the Veterans Affairs Administration is using in their whole health program uh, with every patient now, because they're pulling together concepts of lifestyle medicine, integrative medicine, and positive psychology. And it's made a difference to really uh, acknowledge people where they are and what matters to them. Um, and that links to everything that I've been talking about. And so with that, I end uh, with a slide where I have a photo of my daughter. This was a few years ago. Uh, she's adopted from China. She's my love and my deep relationship and also some, some art that's part of my flow and my engagement. And these are just examples of, of my strengths and uh, the ways that I build my anti-fragility. And uh, I hope that you'll engage with me through the Global Positive Health Institute. I'm looking to uh, not only help health professionals build this into their practices, but we're gonna be building some materials for patients for them or directly to the public where we're linking all of these concepts uh, together uh, to, to make sure that we're all taking full advantage of what I call strengths in the mirror. And uh, thank you for your attention. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Leonoff. That was fantastic. And you know, uh, your artistic skills come through in your slides. <laughs> that is one of the most beautiful slideshows I've ever seen. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just noticed that there, um, I, I made a note about becoming anti-fragile. I thought that was a great term. And somebody put that in the, uh, the chat as well. I love the term anti-fragile. Yeah. So Dr. Friedman, what questions do we have? for our distinguished we have, guests. Yes, we have some good ones. Um, you know, thinking about sort of traumatic events, um, um, 
someone writes about as the pandemic evolved, uh, they became aware that others in their extended family had beliefs and feelings about how science worked uh, that were quite different from their own. And it was shocking to them and they haven't yet recovered from the change in relationships that resulted. Um, and that led to hurtful things said on both sides. And they ask, what's a way to start a positive change in those relationships, even knowing that their separate views have not changed? It's a great question. And I actually have an answer from someone who has made a career of studying relationships and social connection. And that's Dr. Barbara Fredrickson. She spoke at our last conference in September on social connection and someone asked that question and uh, her answer is that uh, it's about listening. It's truly about listening. And you can connect and heal just by listening. You don't have to agree, but just acknowledging the others and, and helping them feel heard, that human to human, you, you do care about them as a human, even if you don't necessarily uh, agree on, on the content that's being discussed. Yeah, I, that's such a great answer. I think, you know, there's, that's been this evolution recently that we've sort of broken down into camps and stopped really listening and acknowledging each other. So um, thank you for that. Um, another one that, um, that I really like as, as a, a geriatrician, um, you talked about cultural differences and, um, it uh, made this person think about differences in how people of younger ages might react to suggestions versus how older generations might. Um, what are your thoughts about, about that? I, so it's a great question about age differences and I've not seen any studies about that. Um, of what we know about younger uh, children at least is that they're more exploratory and experimental. And, uh, and so uh, it really is about trying out different things and seeing what works. And, and we do see that in, in children, how they light up, they find something that really floats their boat and they light up. And uh, we should be doing more of that as adults <laughs> is to experiment, experiment and investigate uh, mm -hmm. what, you know, what, what we enjoy, what makes us happy. Great. Great. So there was a comment from a, um, a fellow lifestyle medicine physician uh, who says, inspiring talk. I use the concept of building a personalized self-care and self-compassion toolkit as a starting point for lifestyle medicine consults. I love the idea of adding character traits and brain strengths to deepen a person's notion of self. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think it is a great place Thank you for that comment. And it's a great place to start is uh, to approach patients with let's, you know, let's build this toolkit together. I mean, you know, of course, the patient mm -hmm. is the, the lead on it, but proactively mm -hmm. and intentionally building all those components uh, is exactly what is music to my ears. <laughs> great. Um, so, uh, here's another one, uh, Susan. I'm, I'm going to implement the quote, what matters most to you as of tomorrow? <laughs> oh, as of tomorrow. <laughs> it puts so much of the presentation and valuable info into a useful, concise place. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, it, the, the, the little joke is instead of we usually say as physicians or health pra practitioners, uh, what's the matter with you? And we switch it around and say, what matters to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Here's another good question. Um, mm. Do you think that brain strengths change as we age? Excellent question. So uh, brain strengths develop um, in, in uh, the early years and most of the studies around, well, Jungian psychology and the uh, Myers-Briggs and the kind of functions, of course, as you can imagine, are in college students but there have been some further studies in adults and then also some researchers uh, looking at uh, older populations. And what happens in older populations, it doesn't, our brain strengths stay the same, but what happens is that, uh, and, and actually we can, I, I should have said this, 
there have been there's been some serious research where they're able to correlate brain strengths with uh, electroencephalograms. Uh, there still needs to be more research, but this is kind of a, a real thing. But what so what happens on those EEGs of older adults is that those brain strengths they've used them so much throughout their life that it no longer triggers the electroencephalogram as much. It's it's but it's there. Uh, it just comes very naturally. And so in order to have um, uh, well more zest for life, more happiness. And uh, from a union psych psychiatric perspective, sort of becoming whole is encouraging older people to try uh, brain functions that are not their strengths. In fact, well, starting in middle age and beyond, we, we need to be experimenting with the other tools in, in that tool set. Remember, there were eight kind of functions that we all experiment with those. Uh, now you can get into some deep psychoanalysis that some of those are not within, not reachable. Uh, and I, I can't speak to that because I'm not a psychotherapist, but in general, I still think it's a useful uh, image to think of them as these eight tools that you reach in and experiment with. Um, and especially as, as you get older and that uh, uh, also, for example, we might use one of them regularly at work uh, but we need a different one uh, at, as a hobby, something uh, that uses a different brain strength as a hobby, and that really helps engage us and revitalize, revi helps us feel more vital, revitalizes us. What would be an example of that? Um, so if, uh, for example, you have a job where you're paying attention more to details, remember that there are the four that are how you take in information. Maybe you're an accountant or something that, you know, it really takes a lot of uh, attention to the details, not, not to screw up. Then uh, what's going to be more of a well-being boost is outside of work to experiment with big picture thinking, maybe reading some books that are more around philosophy or some, and, and that may not come naturally because probably people who go into accounting, for example, are interested in those numbers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so they need to stretch. It's a stretch goal, um, but it helps with their well being. That's very interesting. Um, there was an interesting comment. Um, my interactions with my pets has helped me a lot, especially when most of my interactions with people were limited to the telephone. Uh, talk about relationships that are not necessarily with humans. I'm glad you, you brought up pets. I wish I'd asked that question of someone like Barbara Fredrickson, although I think I, I know what she would say, you know, that uh, those micro moments of connectivity with other humans that I was talking about, uh, I didn't go into a lot of detail, but it's a physiologic synchrony. I mean, when we're in presence with another person, if they're really stressed out or, or you know, <laughs> we're gonna feel stressed out. If they're happy, and calm, we're gonna feel happy and calm. And there's there's no language that needs to go between those human beings for that to, to happen. And so I think animals can provide that same benefit. We can't exactly verbally communicate with them, but sitting with them and if they're calm and content, purring or whatever they're doing, uh, that is physiologically regulating our bodies and it's, it's good for us. Very interesting. Um, I do think that, oh, Susan, go ahead. No, go ahead. So in terms of um, physicians in, in daily practice, what are some things that they can do that are easy uh, that would help with um, you know, a positive psychology and helping their patients that they can fit into a regular visit? Yeah, very, very good. So one thing is to, at least in the assessment uh, where we're looking at emotional states. And we generally are screening for depression, some anxiety, we ask about stress. Uh, we often then stop there, don't stop there, at least ask something about what, what gives them positive emotions, you know, ass assess that informally. You can also, uh, in my other slide deck, when I do the full on lecture for the health professionals, uh, Ed Diener has a satisfaction with life scale. Uh, and that, that's been vetted uh, and uh, out of many, many items. And there are three items that he and his team have boiled it down to. So you could add those uh, life satisfaction uh, items into your review of systems. 
uh, sort of that early intake and get an idea of where someone is. Uh, there are also some emotional, uh, positive emotion questionnaires. Just a few questions and just to keep it top of mind and then keep it top of mind when we're engaging with our patients that we're asking what's gone well for you since the last time I saw you uh, when you see them or at the end of the visit, uh, what, uh, you know, what went well today? You know, what's one thing you feel good about as they're walking out the door? So everyone ends on that high note. Um, and then if we are thinking about health maintenance plans and healthy lifestyles, I've made the case that don't stop at the usual physical activity, diet, sleep, let's get into a few positive activities, you know, and, and talk about that. Maybe it's a commitment to do a, a gratitude practice or uh, build some better social relations. And so there are a few things that, um, and then just a simple one, just what matters to you, <laughs> most to you is a good place to start. So it uh, doesn't have to take a lot of time, uh, but at least having that uh, worldview that it's about those positive emotions that's such a driver, not only for health behaviors, but for those physiologic benefits that doesn't get talked about in medical training at all that I'm trying to change. Right. Um, you had mentioned uh, an app that you had created, the My Happy Avatar. Yeah, yeah so I went through so quickly. I apologize that I didn't get a chance to, to tell you more about it. And again, that probably deserves another talk some other time. Um, but you can go to myhappyavatar.com, which is the, the main, I would call, marketing page. And on there, you can click on Get Started, and it will take you to, you register, and it takes you to another it basically website, it's a WordPress website that, uh, that it is at no cost and that actually most of the elements that you can track in that app are very similar or aligned to what's in my book. It's just, I built that app many years ago, so they don't totally align, but it does help you track uh, some in general, how you are with your health habits, helps you uh, track your character strengths, your brain strengths, your resources, your social supports. And I think of it as a, as a place to go when you just want a reminder of what is it that I've got going on in my life, especially during a dark or difficult time. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another interesting question. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the coming metaverse immersive 3D technologies, uh, what kind of effect do you think this will have on individuals? Excellent question. Again, it has to do with, uh, you know, can we have the same benefits of social connection in the virtual world versus the, the in-person world? And again, someone doing research like that, like Barbara Fredrickson would say, um, it's not quite as good. Uh, it's, 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 it's certainly better than not connecting at all, <laughs> but uh, we're going to have to see in the future what future generations uh, and future research shows about the, the potential de detriments of spending too much time in the virtual world. And uh, the positive psychology research says, get together in person, get together in person, regulate in a positive way, your physiology together, laugh together physically, uh, you know, really experience those positive emotions together. There's just nothing better for your health. Interesting. Um, so we have um, actually a comment here from a, um, <clears throat> the director of one of the residencies in Rochester. Interestingly, we so often start with diet and physical activity or perhaps behavior change. But if we start people with these quote brain strengths, uh, brain strength self-assessments, we, we, they would probably do better slash faster at all of the other lifestyle medicine pillars. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I thank you for that comment. And absolutely, I think that starting with that, again, what matters most with the why, with what someone has as their strengths, well, it goes a long way to unraveling how they can get to the ultimate goals, which are we want that comprehensive, healthy lifestyle. Uh, but mm -hmm. it, it may we may ultimately be more successful that way than to start. Okay, let's talk about your your diet. Uh, so mm -hmm. I I highly recommend it. Positive psychology researchers would highly recommend it. And in fact, it's what got me so excited about this uh, field. In 2017, I was at a conference 
where again, Barbara Fredrickson was the outgoing president at the time of the International Positive Psychology Association. And everything she was talking about was around healthy lifestyles and positive psychology, but yet it was an audience of 2,500 uh, wonderful researchers all in, in, in workforce development, uh, human resources, education, very few of them in, in health, in the field of health and healthcare. But yet uh, the research is showing this is the place to start, positive emotions, and that builds mm -hmm. healthy lifestyles. Yeah. You know, we, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the LIFT program. That yes, yes. Darren Morton. So, no, we run, <clears throat> we run LIFT uh, programs in our, part of our uh, Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute. We also run CHIP programs, and we also, also run our own 15-day uh, whole food plant-based jumpstart. And um, sometimes I think there are people who really shouldn't start with a jumpstart. They really need to start with LIFT because if they're in, if they're in a bad place, uh, it's going to be really hard for them to make the kind of changes that we ask people to make. So, yeah. And of course, Absolutely. we learn a lot about positive uh, learn a lot about positive psychology from Dr. Darren Morton. Yeah. yeah, and and Darren Morton is actually on our advisory council of the Global Positive Health Institute, so we're mm -hmm. we're very much like minded, and uh, he's and the Lift program actually is promoting helping to promote the Global Positive Health Institute. The Lift program is for a general audience, and the Global Positive Health Institute is mostly right now focusing on how to help health professionals uh, mm -hmm. help themselves and help their patients. Mm -hmm. through all of the same lift. concepts though the lift program it's all the same stuff you're right it, it tracks yeah. quite well dr yeah. Lena, could you explain a little bit more about the global positive health institute and how, what are your tools yeah so the so it's a nonprofit organization that i started uh, during mm -hmm. the pandemic to make uh, training in education uh, available to health professionals take that science that is largely published in the psychology literature uh, that often health professionals don't read because they're reading the medical literature. So how do we bridge that, <laughs> that uh, gap? And, uh, and, and then also taking it the next step, uh, translating that scientific literature from psychology into uh, bite-sized pieces like what I've just done for you, modeled for you, so that we can engage health professionals to say, hey, I, I can probably manage one or two of these things. And then hopefully a few of those health professionals, we're going to nudge them to engage in what I'm calling um, translational research. So everything I'm talking about is research informed. In other words, we have some research that informs what I'm telling you. Now we want to be building in healthcare settings, the actual evidence so that when we've got a few health professionals that are excited about doing this and they start to track outcomes and do that, that research, I would love to see that kind of research. And so the Global Positive Health Institute is looking to link researchers and health professionals, get them excited, get them um, on board with this idea that we should be doing more in, in our healthcare space around this link of healthy lifestyles and positive mm -hmm. psychology. Hmm. Kind of, kind of gets to the whole definition of what is medicine, actually, right? <laughs> does medicine have to be complicated and use drugs, and does it have to be dangerous? To... <laughs> yes. Yeah, the side yeah. effects of positive psychology are yeah, right. probably are they? Uh, positive. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Well, I think we have time for one more question, Susan. Is there anything out there uh, that hasn't been hmm. answered that we? Um. Oh, well, the last one is, is positive psychology being taught in medical schools? We are starting, I've heard of some programs. Uh, I've heard of a couple of the colleges, medical colleges. Uh, there's an osteopathic college uh, back east somewhere, I'm not gonna remember the name of it, that are now building positive psychology into the curriculum. So the word is getting out there, but clearly we mm -hmm. have a long ways to go. Uh, in fact, on our advisory council, there's a, uh, a, a, an amazing young uh, medical resident that has developed a whole positive medicine course on her own and is teaching it to professionals and training and med medical students. In fact, I think they just started one um, set of sessions just this month. So yeah, so it's starting, it's the very beginning and hopefully it will become a standardized part of medical education. It is certainly becoming more of a standardized part of our lifestyle medicine, speaking of the competencies that I helped develop and our board certification for lifestyle medicine clinicians has a section on positive psychology. 
Fantastic. And Dr. Leonoff, can you leave us with any final thoughts that will boost our moods until we <laughs> next see you? Um, <laughs> Not yeah. Not to put you on uh, the spot or anything. <laughs> Look, look for the good, look for the good and in, in, in small ways around you. It, a positive psychology sometimes is, isn't about doing. I've been talking a lot about doing. It's about reframing our perspective. Just reframe a little bit. In any situation, you might be able to find some little kernel of goodness that can boost your mood. Mm -hmm. Do that throughout the day. Thank you. That's good advice. Um, thank you so much, Dr. That's Lena, nice. for... Um, enlightening us over this last hour. Last hour, this has been great. Uh, to the people in the audience, <clears throat> for healthcare professionals, uh, next Tuesday we'll be uh, having our lifestyle medicine grand rounds. Um, the importance of a healthy lifestyle for a patient with familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, Dr. Robert Ostfeld will be our guest panelist, and our usual panelists uh, from IHA in Ann Arbor, Michigan, will be joining us. And we have a great uh, presentation uh, from a, a cardiologist at uh, University of Rochester. Uh, and then uh, next month's Lifestyle as Medicine Lecture Series will be uh, Dr. Melissa Sunderman, um, who will be speaking on moving mountains, the power of movement in nature and reaching the peak of well-being. So that will be on Tuesday, May 10th at 7.30, uh, just like this at, uh, as well. So thank you all so much. And it was great to have everybody joining us. And Dr. Lena, thank, thank you. you one more yes, time. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, for sure, sure, absolutely. Take care, everybody. All right. All right, thanks. Well, another time. Thank you for Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, okay. Bye-bye.